Well, hello. Um, my name is Tessa Hobbs Curley, and I am a family life educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the Autumn Health Pick series. This series is a collaboration between Illinois Extension and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois, and is designed to connect those across the state with researchers at the university and provide evidence-based educational programming. Now for a couple of housekeeping items. Before we begin, I would first like to launch a poll. This poll is to collect some basic information from our participants. Once you have entered your information, please feel free to minimize it off your screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Okay. So everybody should be able to see a poll at this time. And like I said, you can minimize it off your screen um, once you have completed it. If you are seeking CEUs or CPDUs, please click the link and fill out the form to check in today's webinar. So I'm gonna put that in the chat box as well. Okay, so I just put it in there. So what you will do is you will cl click on this link and fill out the form. You will be receiving a follow-up email with an evaluation that needs to be filled out to finalize your CEUs or CPDUs, okay? For those of you calling in who would like CEUs or CPDUs, you will go to the web browser and type in go.illinois.edu forward slash credit. So I'm gonna repeat that one more time. For those of you calling in that would like CUs or CPDUs and you did not um, identify that ahead of time, you're going to type in go.illinois.edu forward slash credits. If you have any questions during the program, please type them in the chat box. If you are calling in, please hold your questions until the end of the session. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this series, Heather Kopsko. Heather is a disease ecologist and currently working, works at, as a postdoctorate research associate in the Department of Pathobiology at the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. She completed her PhD in ecology this past May at the University of Rhode Island where she evaluated a photo-based tick surveillance system as a public tick bite prevention tool. In Rebecca Smith's lab here at UIUC, she is working on modeling tick distributions to predict how various environmental factors contributed or contribute to changes in tick distribution and disease prevalence in human and domestic animal populations. Today, she will be talking to us about how you can more readily identify a tech, the potential risk it possesses, possesses, and how to prevent encounters. So I am very excited to introduce you to Heather. Thank you so much, Tessa. I really appreciate that introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, during um, what I imagine is many of your lunch breaks to talk about our favorite uh, mealtime uh, topic, uh, blood sucking arthropods. <laughs> so I hope that I can make this interesting for you and that you will um, learn something that you can apply to um, going out maybe this week in really nice weather um, to protect your family and um, yourself from tick bites. So going forward, I would like to just go over a little bit about what we're gonna talk about over the course of this talk. So I'm gonna discuss first, what even are ticks and why are they potentially dangerous? Um, that will then lead into how to basically identify a tick versus not a tick and um, just a general overview about that. Then I wanna introduce you to commonly encountered ticks in Illinois and what diseases that they may be carrying. And then if you do encounter um, a tick, um, you know, how would you prevent it from biting you? How would you prevent it from biting your pet? And then um, assuming a, a bite happens accidentally, uh, how would you remove this tick from yourself or your pet? So 
to get started, we should probably cover what even are ticks. And so the, um, the basic explanation that I could give is that they are tiny blood sucking parasites that are related to spiders. So they are not actually insects. If you see this in a uh, news article, um, you will now <laughs> for the rest of time, remember that this is not true. They are arachnids, not insects. Um, and they are um, quite widespread across the world. There are about 900 species. They predominantly feed on wildlife or domestic animals, but when those are not immediately available, they will feed on humans as, as we know. Um, because they um, feed on the blood of animals, um, they can become capable of transmitting or vectoring um, infections. So um, in the US, there are seven major ticks of concern. And we say of concern because these are ticks that could potentially transmit diseases to humans or animals. Um, but one major thing I hope that you will come away with today is that not all ticks carry the same diseases or can transmit the same diseases. Um, so being able to identify the type of tick that you are encountering is very important to understanding what your risk may be from that tick bite. Um, as I said before, these are generally pests of wildlife, but they will feed on humans and our pets um, if they get the chance to, if that just happens to be um, who they encounter when they're looking for their blood meal. And um, some of these diseases that they can carry um, can actually be fatal um, or very harmful to our health. So again, reasons to know what we're encountering as well as to prevent them from biting us. So then I wanna introduce a little bit about the different life stages that these ticks go through um, because each of these life stages is active at a different time of the year as well as carries different levels of risk. Um, so to introduce you to these life stages are what are called instars. I'm gonna use the example of a black-legged or a deer tick as um, the, the example to walk you through. And I am choosing this tick a lot today. You'll see this picture and, and this used as an example a lot today because this is the tick that is active right now um, in its adult stage. So I hope you'll become very familiar with what that tick looks like. So. Uh, the first stage that any tick goes through is an egg. So an, um, a female that has uh, blood fed, and that's why uh, she's nice and puffy like that, will lay thousands of eggs. And these eggs will hatch into um, the second stage, which is called larvae. And so for the black-legged tick, this is what it looks like. Um, all larvae have six legs. So often they will be confused with insects for that reason, but they are still arachnids, like I said. Um, so these six-legged larvae are incredibly tiny. Um, they'll be clumped together. So you'll generally encounter these um, in large, large groups. Um, they're often called seed ticks because they're so tiny. And um, the good thing about at least black-legged larvae, just going with this example, is that when they come out of their egg, they have not yet fed on an animal. So they have not yet had the opportunity to um, get an infection. So if you're being bitten by a bunch of these little um, larvae, it's generally not a risk to your health because they have not become infected with anything yet. But once these larvae have had their first um, blood meal, they will molt into their third stage called a nymph. At this stage, they will have eight legs. So another pair of legs emerges as they molt. These ticks are a little bit bigger. They're about the size of a poppy seed. Um, which is obviously not very big. <laughs> so these are considered to be one of the most dangerous stages because they are so tiny and they can spread disease because like I said, they had to take a blood meal um, as larvae to molt into this nymph stage. And um, this makes them rather potentially dangerous. Then uh, the nymph will feed on an animal uh, of some kind, a host and will molt into its fourth and final stage, either an adult male or an adult female. So these also have eight legs. They are about the size of a sesame seed, this particular species, so still pretty small. Um, the males of this species are luckily not um, going to generally infect you with anything. They don't really feed to um, engorge and, and do much more than mate with that female. So. Um, if you find a male on you, it's generally just waiting for a female to show up. 
Whereas the females, however, have had multiple times where they've fed on an animal and could have developed uh, or um, acquired an effect in acquired an infection, excuse me. Um, and so these ticks will be feeding in order to um, support uh, mating and producing eggs. So um, this final stage, right, oops, I'm sorry. Um, this uh, adult female black-legged tick, using this as an example, like I said, because this is what is active now, um, this is a tick you wanna make sure you're looking out for. So these are the four main stages of ticks that you would encounter. All species go through these stages. And um, next I want to introduce you to um, different anatomical or body aspects of a tick that will also help you identify it to species a little bit better. One thing that you can do, um, like I said, these ticks are very small, um, is you can take a photograph of it to zoom in on these different aspects because of course with the naked eye, these are not gonna be easy to see, especially if this tick is moving around. But things that you can look at to identify what type of tick you may have encountered are the mouth parts. So these are what the tick uses to latch onto you and to um, take a blood meal. They are different shapes and sizes for different tick species. So for example, the black-legged tick right here um, has long pointed mouth parts. The American dog tick, um, and these are, all, these are all female examples because they tend to be the most identifiable. Um, they are short and stubby. And then a lone star tick has these long slender mouth parts. So those are things that you can focus on. Next, you can take a look at the, the back of the tick's body. Um, this sort of ridge here is called a festoon and on the black-legged tick, it's smooth. Whereas on the American dog tick and on the Lone Star tick, it's got these little ridges. It almost looks like pie crust. Um, and that will tell you that it is not a black-legged tick. It will tell you that it's either one of these two. And then uh, for females specifically, um, you're going to wanna focus on this front two thirds of the body uh, on the shield that it has. So is it just on the front two thirds, which would make it a female? Um, they need to have all this extra space back here to expand. And so they don't have a shield covering their entire body. Whereas a male does have the shield covering its entire body. Um, what does that pattern look like? Does it have a single dot in the middle, like a Lone Star tick would? Does it have for this modeled pattern, like an American dog tick? Or is it a solid black sputum, like um, the, the black legged tick? These are three things to focus on if you're trying to identify that tick. Um, so you can understand what potential risk it may be carrying. So we've gone over some anatomical points of a tick versus um, what may not be a tick. And I wanna play a little game called Tick or Shtick. So I'm gonna introduce you to some pictures and I want you to type in the chat box whether you think that this is a tick or not. So the first picture is this. Is this a tick or not? I'll give you a little bit of time. All right, seeing lots of different answers, lots of ticks. All right, so this is in fact, oh wow, good job there. This is in fact a tick. This is an adult male brown dog tick. So what we can look at to identify it as a tick are eight legs. Um, adult and nymphal ticks have eight legs. You can see mouth parts up here that are short and stubby. And this is a male tick because it has a shield that covers its entire body. And this particular tick is um, widespread across the country, but is predominantly associated with um, kennels and pets. It is um, a pest of dogs mostly, as the name can tell you. Um, but it can also infest houses. Um, it can infest kennels because it uh, survives very well indoors. So this is not a tick that is a fun one to have around. <laughs> okay, next picture. Tick or shtick?
All right. Good job, everyone. Seeing lots of not ticks and shtick. So correct. This is in fact a spider beetle. So while it looks like it may have eight legs, it is in fact six. This is an insect. Um, these are antennae and um, this body is um, uh, sort of looks like the shape of a tick, but it is in fact a beetle. There are no mouth parts um, with which it can feed. And this is a, um, a common lookalike that you'll often find wandering around your bathroom or other humid locations in your house, um, but not a tick. All right, this one. All right. Seeing some good answers, baby ticks. Yeah. All right. So this is in fact a tick while it has six legs. Remember I said that uh, larvae when they first emerge from that egg only have six legs. And you can tell that this is a tick. It has these short little mouth parts here. This in fact is a larval lone star tick. And so these ticks um, this stage, again, is going to come out in massive numbers from these egg clutches. Um, if you've ever encountered a larval uh, lone star tick bomb, as they're often called, because they tend to clump together on vegetation to increase their chances of being picked up by a host, um, they can deliver some pretty itchy bites. They're, they're pretty annoying. Um, and you'll generally encounter these at the end of the summer and the early fall. Uh, but they can easily be removed with lint rollers or duct tape. Um, and are, are quite annoying, but can be um, removed easily. But yes, this is a tick. All right, is this a tick or not? All right, glad to see. Glad to see these answers. This in fact is not a tick, but not something that you would want to encounter. This is a bed bug. So two antennae and then six legs because it is an insect. Um, it is blood feeding. So, um, you know, similar in that sense to a tick, but it is not a tick. And then finally, tick or shtick. All right, great job, everybody. Seeing. Yeah, I'm seeing species, good job. Um, so this is a tick. This is an American dog tick, the female, uh, the adult female. So we have eight legs. We have short stubby mouth parts. We have a scutum or shield that only covers the, the front two thirds of the body. Um, and this is the, the pattern that you would wanna look for for American dog ticks. They are typically out in the summer, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit about what um, seasonality you'd encounter these ticks in. So we have looked at some really close up pictures of ticks so far, but I wanna really reinforce for you just how tiny they are. So on this picture of a poppy seed muffin, there are five nymphal uh, black-legged ticks. So I want you to take a second or two to look at all of these different dots and see if you can identify where five nymphal black-legged ticks are. <laughs> the CDC put this picture out um, a couple years ago and uh, it, it upset people <laughs> a lot. They vowed to never eat a poppy seed muffin again. <laughs> All right, so I will point them out to you. So here's one, two, three, four, and five. Incredibly tiny. Um, just to show you for scale, we can get a little bit off when we look at some zoomed in pictures, but they are incredibly tiny. They also will change appearance as they feed, which also can make them difficult to identify. Sometimes they will look like warts or moles um, on your body or on a pet or something like that. So as a tick feeds, it will engorge. And so these are female adult, um, sorry, adult female black-legged ticks. And as you can see, the, the sputum stays the same. So that's why it's a good landmark for identifying it. But this whole 
body will start to puff up with blood over the course of hours. Um, the mouth parts stay identifiable for the most part. And um, yeah, the really the only thing that changes is the body. And a good thing to point out here as well is that as the tick feeds, the likelihood of disease transmission increases. So that will be different for every disease, every tick species, but generally the longer a tick is on you, the worse the situation is. So you wanna make sure that you are finding those ticks really early on if they do attach. So let's go through some of the ticks that are in Illinois. So first up, the one you should know really well by now is the black-legged tick or the deer tick as it's commonly called because um, it is associated with white-tailed deer. That is its, um, its reproductive host. So the adults will mate on the deer and that's where um, large clutches of ticks come from. So it is active throughout the year, which is something that is often um, a surprise to many people. The nymphs, so this one is out in the spring as well as adults that had not yet found a, a blood meal. The summer you will find early on the nymphs and then later in September or late August and September, the larvae will be out. Um, in the fall, you'll still have a little bit of larvae left over, but the fall and the winter are the adult time. So if you are um, a hiker, if you're a hunter and you're out in the, the woods at this time, this is when you will encounter this tick anytime that the temperature is above freezing. These ticks have a wonderful um, adaptation in their, uh, their blood, which is called hemolymph. It's basically an antifreeze pro anti protein. And so when it gets really cold and, and, and we have frosts and freezes, they are able to hunker down in leaf litter or even under snow and survive. So anytime it warms up for a consecutive couple days, uh, several days, they will reemerge. Um, as, as an example, uh, one of the times that I got Lyme disease was in March when it had warmed up and um, it they were out. So um, be on the lookout and I will talk more about how to prevent them from biting this time of year. So these ticks are the ones that transmit Lyme disease. While you may have heard that other ticks um, have been found to have uh, the Lyme disease bacteria in them, this is the only tick that can transmit Lyme disease to you. So this is a one to really watch out for. Um, but you can be rest assured that if you encounter another type of tick, it is not going to give you Lyme disease. It can give you other things, but not Lyme disease. Um, they can also transmit anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and not so much in this area at this particular time, but they are um, capable of transmitting something called Powassan virus as well. But that is rare in this region of the country at this particular point, thankfully. In uh, Illinois, this is where we have found um, black-legged ticks at this point in time. They will be found on forest edges and trails, and they will quest or seek a host um, from the tops of grassy, shrubby vegetation. They are very sensitive to drying out, so they need to be close to forests and leaf litter and edges where they can get into shade in order to rehydrate. Um, and in this map, the white counties are where we have not yet observed these ticks. Um, the light blue counties are where they have been reported. So fewer than six individuals were observed. And then in the dark blue counties, that's where we have established populations of these ticks. So that means that there are more than six individuals or two life stages have been observed in those counties. So you'll see they're basically more concentrated in the Northern part of the state um, at this particular point in time that we have known about. The American dog tick is a very common tick. Um, I'm sure you've encountered this one out in the summer. So adults in, are out in the spring and the summer, um, but they are generally dormant in the fall and the winter. And again, they can um, hunker down in leaf litter and protect themselves very, very well when it gets cold. The larvae and the nymph of this species are ones that we're generally not going to encounter as humans and our pets rarely encounter them as well. These are more strictly parasites of wildlife um, it doesn't mean you can't find them, but it's just generally pretty rare to find them on humans or pets. They are capable of transmitting Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and um, something called tick paralysis, which is um, there are toxins in their saliva that can trigger um, a, a paralysis as long as they're attached. So this is something that is a little bit more of a concern for our pets. Um, but as soon as that tick is removed, the paralysis goes away. So it is a reversible thing, but it is something to be aware of if 
you know, your dog develops some lameness, um, this is something to, to think about that it could be tick related. Heather, you, yeah. you had a question in the chat box oh, about if they prefer dry conditions rather than rainy wet conditions. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, so they, uh, they will quest more when it's drier out, but they need, so for example, they won't be really questing or out when it's rainy, but um, they need that moisture to rehydrate themselves. So if it's been raining for a couple of days and then you have a good couple of dry days after that, that is when they're going to be sort of primed and ready to go um, because they've hydrated and they are, um, they have the energy and the reserves to be able to um, go look for their hosts. Um, so yes, questing, questing is the, the term for seeking, host seeking. Um, yes. Okay. So um, thanks again for that question. So the American dog tick um, is much more uh, capable of withstanding dry conditions. So it will be more active regardless of, of rain um, compared to the, uh, the black-legged tick. And so the American dog tick is more concentrated in the southern portion of the state at this point. Um, it is gonna be found in grasslands and will quest or host seek from the tops of these grassy or shrubby vegetation. Um, just waiting for their host to pass by. And again, that same legend um, is in play for this map as well. And the Lone Star Tick is a newer tick to our region. Um, this is going to be a tick you're going to encounter in the spring. You'll see the adults, these, uh, the adult male and the adult female. Um, the summer is when the nymphs will generally be out. And then the fall is when you'll get those, those larval tick bombs, as I talked about earlier. Um, this tick can transmit Ehrlichia, and you may have started to hear a little bit more about something called alpha-gal red meat allergy. So I included a link there. So when these slides come out, you can go to that, or you can go to it now if you, if you want to. Um, so what this tick is capable of doing, and it's rare, but it can happen, um, its saliva can sensitize you to um, a carbohydrate that is on the muscle cells of mammals. So this is not protein, sorry, this is not um, poultry, this is not fish. This is predominantly beef or pork. Um, and uh, it can cause um, a sensitivity reaction to eating these meats. And so again, it doesn't always happen every time you get bit. It doesn't, it's, it's a rare thing, but it is a known phenomenon at this point that we're learning more about as we start to study it. So reasons to not get bit by this tick, if you like red meat. <laughs> um, and this tick can also transmit some rickettsial illnesses across like the span of um, different types of rickettsia. So this tick is not a pleasant one. Um, its bites are very itchy. It's just very irritating. Um, and they are very aggressive biters. So most ticks um, quest. So they will just sit and wait. They're sort of like sit and wait predators. Whereas lone stars um, will actually do that as well as detect your carbon dioxide, detect your body heat, and move toward the host. With their bite. Um, so they are quite aggressive. They are also located predominantly in the southern part of the state right now in grasslands, forests, open fields. They're very resilient ticks. Um, so hopefully, um, yeah. They'll, they'll stay more down there, but that's that's where we're seeing them at this particular point in time. And then the fourth tick I wanna introduce you to is a new arrival to this area. Looks a little bit like the American dog tick as well as the Lone Star tick sort of put together, but it's called the Gulf Coast tick, um, which is much it's more of a misnomer at this particular point. Um, it can be found in the Southern, uh, it's mostly found in the Southern Atlantic range. Um, and that's where we know about its behavior. So we really don't know very much about how it's behaving uh, in Northern latitudes at this particular point, but the spring is generally when you're gonna see the adults, spring and summer, um, and the larvae will generally be out in the fall. Um, but again, these are in the Southern range and we're just learning about how it's behaving up here. So at the particular point, oh, I'm sorry, um, it also can transmit a rickettsia. So um, right now we know that it can exist in open fields and roadsides and just very dry habitats. It, it is a very resilient tick, very similar to the Lone Star tick. And it's only been seen in sort of spotty regions around the state, but this is something that we're watching and trying to track um, because of its um, new sort of invasion into the state. 
And to give you just a broad comparison of these four major tick species together, um, this is what they look like compared to one another. So it can all start to look very similar, um, but I'm hoping that as you're seeing them next to each other now that you'll start to be able to pick out some of the differences from the skeutal patterns, the, the shield patterns on the males versus the females, um, and then just the differences amongst all the different ticks and their stages. Um, it takes you know, a little bit of practice in looking at them, especially you know, when you're looking at them up close versus in person, um, but I'm hoping you're starting to narrow in on some of those key anatomical details at this point. So how do we prevent them from biting? And that's, that's really the, the whole point of this talk <laughs> is to prevent them from biting. And so one thing I really wanna drive home is that we shouldn't be relying on any single method to prevent a tick bite. A multi-pronged approach is really the way to go, um, but I wanna go over some of the most important things that you can do to prevent tick bites. So frequent tick checks are one of the most important things that you can do and knowing where to look on your body after you've been out in tick habitat. So they wanna hide around warm, um, moist areas where they're generally not going to be found. And so that is in your hair, um, around your ears and under your arms. They will get into your belly button um, or around your waistband where they can just um, sort of hunker down there. Um, between your legs or on the back of your knees is often a place where they will um, latch on. These are also places that are similar to our pets. So in the ears, around their eyes where they can't groom, um, between their legs and between their toes is one place that is a really good one to check between their paw pads um, and under their front legs. And generally, if your dog or your cat has tick protection um, products on it, um, it will prevent the ticks from sort of getting to the, the main body, but the products don't always extend to the extremities of the animals. So that's why looking at the toes or on the legs uh, around the tail are good places to be checking for ticks. And so even if you have protection on your pet, it's still really a good idea to keep checking after you've gone outside or you've spent time in tick habitat. Um, because like I said, not everything is uh, foolproof and it's just good to have a multi-pronged approach and back have backups for your backups. So then another way to avoid getting um, a tick on you or getting bitten by a tick is to know where that tick habitat is and to avoid it. And that's, again, not always easy to do. Um, but on this uh, guide here, there is a path um, where it is open and then you've got the edges. And so for you know, certain ticks like the black legged tick, avoiding these edges is a good way to um, prevent the likelihood of encountering one because they need to stay on these moist edges where there's shade and there's um, moisture reserves for them. But like some of the other ticks I went over, they are more resilient. They will um, be able to tolerate being out in sunlight in drier conditions for longer, but they generally will go to a vegetation source to be able to find their host, to, to get a little height so they can latch on as the host goes by. So if you are aware of this, this is a good thing to keep in mind. And you know, maybe you like going through the, the vegetation and you know, that's fine too, but just be aware of when you are, be aware of being in uh, tick habitat when you are so that you can do a more thorough check when you're done or you know, making sure you check before you get in your car to go home, those types of things. It's just awareness of where you are and where the ticks are. Another way is to maintain a tick unfriendly yard. So um, a lot of tick encounters can happen in our backyards, depending on what our backyards look like. If our backyards are really hospitable to wildlife, deer, rodents, things like that, those animals can be bringing ticks with them into the yard. They can be dropping off and they can be um, a risk for ourselves as runner yards or for our pets to bring them in the house. So um, maintaining things like deer fencing or um, making sure that your rock piles are um, further away from your home or that you don't have wood piling up next to your house where rodents can get in um, and establish homes, making sure bird feeders are well away from your house or protected. Things like that are going to make your, your yard less hospitable to ticks. Um, 
there are certain in invasive species that make our yards a little bit more um, tick friendly. Things like Japanese honey honeysuckle or barberry are creating nice habitats for the ticks to exist in. Um, and so making sure those are away from your home or just not present on your property is a good thing as well. Um, there's a little circle here with a little drawing of a mouse and a tick tube. And so um, what this is, uh, these are these pesticide delivering um, devices where uh, a tick can go, a tick, sorry, a mouse can go into this tube, collect um, cotton that's in there that's been treated with um, a, a tick um, killing um, pesticide um, called permethrin. Um, it's basically the same as what you would put on your, your dog. Um, and it will take that cotton back to its nest and basically treat itself for ticks in doing so. Um, so that's, that's something that you can also put around your yard to um, protect um, your yard from the nymphal black-legged ticks that can be carrying um, Lyme disease. And so a third way is to wear an effective repellent. And I, I highlight that word effective because there are just lots of ideas out there about what we can put on ourselves to keep ticks off. Um, lots of home remedies, lots of different recipes I've seen um, floating around the internet, but I want to um, ensure the word effective is, um, is something you go home with today. And so what does effective even mean, right? So um, I wanna talk about EPA registered versus unregistered or minimum risk products. So something that is important to recognize is this symbol here um, that is put out by the EPA. Um, and so this is a certification that a product and the active ingredient in that product have been both evaluated for human safety and effectiveness um, and are determined to be safe for use when the product is used according to the label. So this means that tests have been performed that not only determine that this is safe for human use, but also will work against ticks. Um, the EPA will also register, uh, or sorry, they will also um, have products that are unregistered, but they have, the only thing that is really determined about these products is that the active ingredient in the product is minimal risk to human health. So the EPA has said, you know, this is, this is fine for people to use. Um, we don't need you, no, we don't need it to be registered, but the catch with that is this means that the repellent has not been tested by tick scientists or people evaluating whether it actually works to repel ticks or you know mosquitoes since oftentimes these are used for the same um, repellency. So it is really important to know what type of product you're using and what it will be capable of doing. So I wanted to go over some of the major ones that you'll see on the market and just talk a little bit about the the cost benefit ratios right because I know a lot of people are not big on putting pesticides on themselves or on their pets, and that is totally understandable. Um, but what's great now is we have lots of different products that can meet your needs with, with what you're comfortable with, with what um, you're willing to use or not willing to use, but also still provide a great amount of protection for you. So at the top of the list here, we have DEET, and I'm sure everyone is very familiar with DEET. This is basically the gold standard for insect repellents. It's been on the market since the 1950s, um, and it's one of the most widely used repellents because it is so effective against several species of flies and mosquitoes. Um, but for ticks, it is considerably less effective. So it can repel ticks, um, black-legged ticks, not as much as dog ticks and Lone Star ticks, um, but it is still an effective skin repellent to use if that is what you would like to do. If you wanna use it to repel mosquitoes as well, it is excellent against mosquitoes. So sort of a catch-all type of skin repellent. Um, you can also use it on your clothing. Um, people are a little concerned about this because of the, um, the toxicity if you use a very high percentage of it. Um, there are recommendations to not use higher than 30% on children. And um, if you use it according to the, um, the recommended instructions, it is fine to use on children. Personally, I use it on my child um, because we follow the instructions. So it can offer great protection. It is EPA registered, it can offer great protection, but understandable people are not always comfortable with DEET. There is something out now called LipoDeet, 
which is a new formulation that um, incorporates uh, fat molecules into this lotion. And it actually prevents the absorption of the DEET into the skin that a lot of people are concerned about. And because it prevents the absorption into your skin, it is actually um, effective for a longer period of time. It is um, effective for 11, up to 11 hours over eight hours um, and is considered to be a much more effective repellent because of that. So that might be a great alternative if you are uncomfortable about using DEET. Um, permethrin is an excellent, excellent um, repellent. Uh, it also is considered something called a knockdown because it will kill ticks on contact. It is a clothing or fabric um, treatment. So you don't put it on your skin because it just basically wears off very, very quickly. There's, there's no reason to put it on your skin. If you put it on your clothing, it adheres to the fabric and it can provide repellency and this knockdown effect to ticks um, for up to four weeks. So it's what the military uses in their uh, uniforms. It's what um, hunters use in their uniforms. Oftentimes it can treat camping equipment. It can treat uh, dog beds. You know, it can just basically treat any type of um, fabric. So it is a great option to use in conjunction with skin products. But the one thing to be um, aware of with this is that uh, the product, when it's in its liquid form, when it's wet and hasn't dried yet, it can be toxic to cats. So you have to be careful if you have cats in the home um, with using it around them. But once it's dry, it is, it is not toxic to cats any longer. Uh, Picardin is another one you may have heard of. I've got some of the, the um, trade names here. This is a synthetic black pepper. Um, compound that is really good at um, repelling Lone Star ticks. Um, but it generally needs to be at a very high percentage. Otherwise, it's really no more effective than, than DEET. But if you feel comfortable using this, it's just a matter of knowing what the length of time that it is effective for um, and reapplying once, once you've reached that, that window. Something called IR. Uh, 3535, you may know it more by the trade name of Skin So Soft, is also um, a good um, minimal risk, but also effective product that is more repellent against black legged ticks than DEET. So that might be something you might feel more comfortable with. Oil of lemon eucalyptus is another um, more, you know, quote unquote, natural product that is coming out now that's been evaluated. It is um, quite effective, but not a good idea for children under the age of three because it is uh, has this essential oil compound in it that can be um, irritating to the lungs and the skin of, of, sense of children who have pretty sensitive skin. And then finally, another one I'm not sure if you've seen um, is a synthetic tomato leaf derivative. Um, and I should mention that all of these are uh, synthetic forms of some pesticide that is naturally found in plants. That's, that's how we get these. Um, permethrin is a synthetic chrysanthemum flower, um, black pepper, like I said, eucalyptus leaf. So um, the reason why it is synthetic is because on its own, these products would evaporate or lose their repellency um, properties very, very quickly. So they are combined with um, different compounds to make them last longer um, and actually serve the purpose that we're looking to serve. So um, BioUD is this uh, tomato leaf derivative that um, has the lowest toxicity level registered by the EPA, um, but that's only based in lab studies. Um, we really don't have a good sense yet of how it works in the field. Um, it's, its effectiveness has really only been lab evaluated, but something to look out for. So these, um, I would recommend um, people look into them. And I have a link at the end of the, the talk that can take you to an EPA website where you can put in what you're interested in, what kind of um, time do you need the repellent to work, what types of repellents do you not want to use. Um, and it will actually uh, find a repellent and make suggestions for you for what you uh, might want to use that fits your needs and your, um, your comfortability level. Heather? Yes. There's another question in the chat box oh, in thank regards you so much. to whether or not it repels or kills ticks on contact. Um, Lipogeet, I believe, only repels. I don't believe it's kills on contact. Okay. So these are all great for humans, um, but what about your pet? 
right? So um, I'm not a veterinarian. Um, so I'm going to drive home the idea that you should be talking to your vet about what is best for your pet. Um, but I do want to introduce you to two of the main classes of repellents for, for pets. So there are skin applications, the ones that sort of go between the shoulder blades all the way down to the tail. Um, and these range from monthly reapplications to um, collars that can last up to eight months. So this comes down to what do you feel, you know, are you going to remember to put it on every month? Would you prefer something that lasts for a longer period of time? Um, what kind of sensitivities does your pet have to some of these products? These are things that you should be discussing with your vet um, to make sure that you're getting the safest product for your pet, that your pet would tolerate the best. But I feel that it is important for you to make sure you're using this all year round because of the potential for your pet to encounter a tick at any time of the year. There are also chewables that can be used on their own or with in conjunction with these, um, these topical products. Um, these are newer and um, have had some really great um, results. The Next Garden Zimperica ones are monthly and then Brevecto is one um, one dosage every 12 weeks. So you get a little bit more um, time between reapplications. But again, the important thing about whatever product you choose for your pet is that it is used all year round. And again, I'm also making sure to reinforce using ones that have been tested um, and evaluated for effectiveness against ticks. Um, products that just rely on um, essential oils, can be a little bit of a false uh, sense of security, I think. And some of these essential oil um, compounds actually can be very um, dangerous to your pet. Uh, they can be very sensitive to um, how volatile some of these chemical or these essential oils can be. So I would urge caution with using um, essential oils on your pet. So here are all these great ways to prevent a tick, but still encountered a tick, what do you do? So I think it is important to not panic. And when you are outdoors, um, make sure you always have tweezers on you or readily available. And the best way that I recommend to remove ticks that you have encountered are to use pointy tweezers. So these are, you, you know, surgical tweezers or, um, any, any tweezers that have a very pointy end, not blunt sort of, um, you know, uh, cosmetic type tweezers. Grasp that tick at the closest part to your skin, right at the, at the mouth parts, as close as you can get, and, and just pull gently um, right up and out. There are lots of products on the market that have, you know, twisting abil um, capabilities and different ways to remove it. Um, but this is a tried and true simple method to removing that tick. Um, breaking the mouth parts off in your skin is not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's not necessarily going to increase the risk of a tick-borne illness, but it can increase the irritation around the area. Your skin might react to that, um, the tick mouth parts being broken in your skin, um, and it just may cause a localized infection. Without the body attached, you cannot continue to inject potential pathogen into your skin, um, but it's still just a good idea to get the tick out cleanly as possible. I have mentioned here to not apply petroleum jellies, matches, rubbing alcohols, nail any, any external um, substance is not a good idea to apply to a tick that you're trying to get off of your skin. And the reason I say that is because we don't have a good sense that this is what happens every single time, but the, the theory and the, the idea behind it is that if a tick is attached to you and is um, being suffocated by a substance, soaps or whatever, it could agitate that tick and cause it to try, um, cause it to inject more potential pathogen disease into you as it is trying to remove itself from your skin to get away. So it is always best to grab it as close to the skin as possible. Do not squeeze it with your fingers because um, that also can squeeze more disease into you potentially. And um, always a good idea just to wash your skin where the, the bite happened afterward to prevent any localized skin infection that may have occurred from trying to remove the tick itself. The next important thing to do after you've encountered a tick is to make sure you save it. So as gross as they are, um, it's 
a really good idea to put them into a clear sealable baggie, label that bag with who that tick was on, what was the date that you found it, and where do you think that you got it? Then keep it in the freezer. Um, many times people will put in alcohol, which is generally fine, um, but if you are interested in having that tick tested um, for pathogens, it, it depends on each lab which um, what they want it to be kept in. But a good idea is always just to keep it in the freezer. It will kill it um, and it will um, preserve it. So I've highlighted the, the testing aspect here. Um, and just a note about tick testing is that it's generally not recommended because the presence of a pathogen in that tick, if that tick tests positive for something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have been infected with it. And the same, um, in the same, you know, uh, on the other hand, it also may not necessarily be a true negative if it tests negative, because if you encountered one tick, you may have encountered another tick that you just didn't see. Um, so it is hard to um, rely on what exactly is in the tick to determine what your disease status, having been bitten by that tick, would necessarily be. So if you would like to find out, potentially, if that will put you at ease, you know, by all means, go ahead, but do not necessarily use that tick's infection status as um, a guarantee that you are infected with a tick-borne illness or not infected with a tick-borne illness. And so you've encountered this tick, you've saved it, what, what do you do with it now? So if you've been able to identify it, you can, um, you, you know what it is, that's what's wonderful, but you can also check with some identification services. Here at the University of Illinois, we have the Illinois Tick Inventory Collaboration, which um, collects, uh, will take ticks um, in their, their specimen form. It will identify them, and then this will also be serving as surveillance for the state. Um, at the moment, we are not collecting ticks because of COVID, but we have partnered with the Tick app, which is a really, really convenient way to have your tick identified and to also be part of a citizen science study to understand um, encounter behaviors as well as tick surveillance um, around the country. So you can download the tick app um, on both Android and um, iPhones, and you can go and you can report ticks that you've encountered by taking a photo and you will have someone get back to you identifying that tick for you and um, telling you, you know, some potential risk factors that you may have encountered with that tick. And then if you've been bitten by a tick, it's important to monitor your symptoms. So be on the lookout for any types of new rashes that may um, show up. So um, I've put here pictures of uh, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, which is not Lyme disease, but sort of mimics Lyme disease. And that can be caused by the bite of a Lone Star Tick, which I realized I just forgot to put in that list of <laughs> diseases for it. Um, the classic Lyme disease rash bullseye, which is the classic form, but um, important to know that Lyme disease does not always um, show up just as a bullseye rash. It can not have a rash or it could have all sorts of different types of rashes. So any weird rash that may show up after a tick bite is good to keep an eye on. Um, and then below that, I have a picture of what happens in Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So any kind of fever, rash, abnormal headaches, if you're just generally not feeling well, make sure to contact your doctor about that. It's also really good to let them know that you were bitten by a tick um, and what type of tick it was and how long it was feeding. So that will give your physician a better idea of what you could potentially um, be dealing with and what types of tests to potentially order for you. And then if you do have a rash or um, a bite site, document it with photos and um, just sort of keep an eye on it just to know, you know, is something developing or is it not? Um, oftentimes a tick bite will look really angry and look really irritated but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a tick-borne illness. It could just very well be your immune reaction to the components in that tick saliva, but it's still really good to keep some documentation of that to have an idea of what, what it is or what it is not. And so those are all really important things to provide your physician um, and can help them um, either diagnose you or um, help them know that, that you're actually okay and, and you don't have to worry about um, a tick-borne illness. And so, to finalize all of this, I have five key takeaways that I want you to, um, to remember after this talk. And one is to be familiar with the common tick species in your area and their active seasons. If you know 
what you're potentially going to encounter, you'll have a better idea of what that could mean for you if you do get a tick bite. It's important to use effective repellent or protection on both people and pets. And remember um, to look for that emblem from EPA registered products to have the best chance at um, repelling uh, ticks. Make frequent tick checks a habit when you're outdoors. Try to work that into your whole, um, uh, you know, going outdoors, you come back, you um, you leave your boots by the door, you, you check for ticks. Just try to work that into your whole routine when you are engaging in outdoor activity. When you do encounter a tick, or if you do encounter a tick, hopefully it's just a sniff, um, remove attached ticks as soon as possible with pointy tweezers. Again, no matches, don't put soap on it, just, just take it off and save that tick. It's really important information um, that you can get from uh, what species it is and potentially what it could be infected with. And some other resources that I hope you get a chance to take a look at. Uh, the Illinois Department of Public Health has a great resource on different ticks in this area. If you wanna learn more about the iTIC program, here is the link for that as well as the tick app. So you can download that and participate in um, that project. The CDC has a ton of information about ticks on their website. And this is that EPA uh, repellent finder that I mentioned earlier to, to find the repellent that works best for you in your situation. And another really great resource is the Tick Encounter Resource Center at the University of uh, Rhode Island. They have a lot of photos and identification resources as well as another program to have a tick identified. Heather? Yes. There was a question in the chat box about the EPA emblem that you showed and they wanted to know um, was that the EPA emblem or not? Um, yes, as far as I know, that is the EPA emblem, unless they've changed it recently. That was the one I was familiar with. Um, but if you go to the EPA, um, find the repellent that's right for you. If they've updated it, and I'm just not aware of that, that that's where that would be. And I want to thank all of you so much for attending. And I hope this was um, informative. And if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. But be sure also to tune in next week for um, uh, Noah Hutchinson's talk. He's going to talk about immune health and how that is related to your diet. There are a couple more questions in there, Heather. Yes. Um, I'll look at those if you want to take a look at that. Yes. Okay. So website to check for ticks in Florida. Um, if you go to um, the University of Florida's entomology department has a great resource on ticks. Um, I don't have the website at my disposal right now, but um, yeah, if you go to the University of Florida's entomology website, that is, that is where you can find a great resource on ticks in Florida. Um, Tick Encounter Resource Center also um, has a lot of information about ticks in the Southeast. Um, Lipodete. I am not um, familiar about whether Lipodete melts plastic, um, but I would venture to guess that it probably has very similar properties to regular DEET. Uh, the fact that it is combined with fat molecules may make it less susceptible to that, but I, I do not know actually. So that is that is something I will look into because that's a great um, that's a great question. And wear light clothing when you're hiking. So I didn't really mention the the typical um, uh, clothing parameters for uh, dealing with ticks in the woods. So uh, yes, it's always great to tuck your pants into your socks. It's always great to wear light clothing so that you can see the ticks that may be crawling on you. Um, yeah, so those are great things to do. And Japanese honeysuckle is, uh, it can create really good environments for ticks to hide in. So Japanese honeysuckle is not a good um, invasive to have on your property. And did I get all of the questions? I think that was all of the questions. Um, if there are any more questions. Um, yes, and so right, for, um, for habitat managers, um, keeping invasives um, out also is a great way to prevent ticks um, 
deer tend to like invasives and deer bring ticks. So um, yeah, invasives tend to go hand in hand with ticks, unfortunately. And I know there was a couple questions about where they can go um, to receive this webinar or to hear it again. And I put that link in um, the chat box as well. And I just wanna thank you um, everyone for joining us today and your feedback is incredibly valuable to us. And we would love to hear from you and what topics you'd like to learn more about. So again, you will see that I've put the links in the chat box about completing the evaluation. So again, if you could take time to do so, that would be great.